Welcome back to Online Shakespeare. Today we're going to begin Othello. Othello is also a tragedy, but it's a very different style of tragedy from Hamlet. Um, it deals with different sorts of issues. One thing is that while Hamlet tends to be very diffuse and very large, that's why you got five lectures on it, Othello is incredibly tightly constructed. Um, when you may remember that when the O.J. Simpson trial was going on, there were constant references to Othello in the news, but I'd like to think the play is a little more complex than that. Um, the source is an Italian novella by Cintio, and um, that was something that was worked in as far as the plot. Um, another source is a book by a man named Leo Africanus, an African whose works were translated into English by John Pory. And many of the sections in which Othello talks about his travels and his experiences come from the Pory translation of Leo Africanus. In 1603, just a few years before this play was written, the first delegation of Moroccans had come to the Elizabethan court. And so that was a big novelty. The, the contact with that part of the world was just really starting. And then on top of that, um, there was a contemporary mask called the Mask of Blackness, in which Queen Anne and her ladies um, put black makeup all over themselves and more absolutely beautiful um, Nile green and blue costumes and um, that was considered to be a very very unusual thing for them to do. Um, sometimes Shakespeare is accused of being a racist and sometimes he's defended on the grounds that there were no Moors in London, there were no black people in London. Well that is not true. Um, there was a deportation order signed by Queen Elizabeth, and you can't sign a deportation order to deport people who aren't there. So that was definitely part of it. Um, however, the understanding of the difference between Islamic culture and Turkish culture and sub-Saharan African and all of these distinctions was something that I would expect the average Elizabethan really couldn't quite make. Um, it's very compressed. The play is very compressed. Sometimes people talk about this play being in double time. That is that there's um, an internal clock and then there's an external clock because it doesn't seem like there's enough time in the play for all the things to happen that do happen. And I assume that the reason, the real reason why critics write about double time is because on the page you have enough time to notice the difference between the, how the different things are lining up. But when you watch the play, all you know is that it's going at breakneck speed. So I just dismiss double time. Just ignore that stuff. Um, Othello is also one of the few places where we have an eyewitness account of a performance during Shakespeare's lifetime. Uh, there was an account of a boy playing Desdemona up at Oxford, and supposedly he was so effective at playing Desdemona that he brought tears to the audience's eyes. So our idea is that um, boys couldn't possibly have done a good job as women. Um, certainly the contemporary audiences didn't think so. Some major themes to watch for in this play. Cultural disjuncture. Um, miscommunication between culture, the nature of evil, which is very heavily explored in this play, um, the ruin of trust, how that happens, and also the way that the honest assume that everyone is like themselves. This is something that gets the good people in the play into enormous trouble because by virtue of being virtuous, they assume that everyone else is virtuous too and they are trustworthy, so they are trusting. And of course, not everybody is trustworthy, and the, the untrustworthy tend to be very untrusting, which gives them an edge in dealing with the trustworthy people. Another thing that you'll notice, Iago will remind you very much of Richard III, and that's because um, he also is modeled on the medieval vice figure that I talked about. He's got a lot of direct address to the audience, a lot of engaging us in his plots. And just like Richard III, um, we also are going to be sort of drawn in to a certain extent, but we're also going to lose sympathy for him at a certain point. 
Now, I always like when I start with a play to really look at how a play begins. Remember that Richard III began with Richard coming out and just talking. Um, Twelfth Night began with music. Um, Hamlet began with a couple of guys running around in the dark in a panic. This play also sort of begins with a couple of guys running around in the dark, but they're not in a panic. The two men are Iago, who is a soldier. He works for Othello. Um, a lot of people don't understand um, Iago's role. He talks about himself being an ancient, and I guess people think, well, he's what? Ancient? Does that mean he's old? No, what he is is an ensign. And if you think of him as being like a non-commissioned officer, he has gotten as far up the military ladder as he can without getting a commission. And he has put in a lot of effort and he's shed his blood and he's very angry that somebody who is the equivalent of somebody from West Point or Annapolis has been given the title of lieutenant above him. He feels that he deserves that promotion, and that is one of the festering sources of his anger and desire for revenge. The other man is Roderigo. Um, he can be quickly dismissed. He's a rich idiot. He's a rich idiot who wants Desdemona, and he has failed. Iago has promised to get him Desdemona, and he hasn't so far. Um, Iago has to explain to Roderigo that despite the fact that he works for Othello, he hates him, and he has no um, sense of loyalty to him. And one of the reasons is because of this promotion thing. And he complains about the man who's been chosen. Forsooth, a great arithmetician, one Michael Cassio, a Florentine, a fellow almost damned in a fair wife, that never set a squadron in the field, nor the division of a battle knows more than a spinster, unless the bookish theoric, wherein the togged consuls can propose as masterly as he. But he, sir, had the election, and I, of whom his eyes had seen the proof at Rhodes, at Cyprus, and on other grounds christened and heathen, must be believed and calmed by debitor and creditor, must his lieutenant be, and I, God bless the mark, his moorships ancient. Now, there's a lot of racist language in this play, um, a lot of racism in this play, and one way it shows up is in the way that people don't use Othello's name when they talk about him, most specifically um, Othello. I mean, most specifically Iago does not use his name. Um, just like we waited to hear Viola's name, notice that we have not heard Othello's name, and we will not hear it until a little bit later into the play. And also, I just want to put in a plea at this point um, for you to please try not to be offended by some of the things that are just in this play. They're just in this play, and that's what's there. Um, Iago says that he's not interested in being a, an honest servant. He's interested in being a servant so that he can get what he wants. I follow him to serve my turn upon him. We cannot all be masters. Nor all masters cannot be truly followed. You shall mark many a duteous and knee-crooking knave that doting on his own obsequious bondage wears out his time, much like his mastered ass, for naught but provender, and when he's old cashiered, whip me such honest knaves. Others there are who trimmed in forms and visages of duty, keep yet their hearts attending on themselves, and throwing but shows of service on their lords, do well thrive by them, and when they have lined their coats, do themselves homage. These fellows have some soul, and such a one I do I profess myself, for, sir, it is as sure as you are Roderigo, were I the Moor, I would not be Iago. In following him, I follow but myself. Heaven is my judge, not I for love and duty, but seeming so, for my peculiar end. For when my outward act action doth demonstrate the native act and figure of my heart and complement extern, tis not long after, but I will wear my heart upon my sleeve for daws to peck at. I am not what I am. Now, Iago has just got done explaining to Roderigo that he is not what he seems. 
that in fact when he seems to be what he is he'll start wearing his heart on his sleeve and that's the first um, occurrence of that in English people talk about people who have their hearts on their sleeves but also he says I am not what I am and something that the Elizabethan audience would have been very conscious of is that when Moses in the Old Testament asks God well who should I say sent me God says I am that I am say that I am sent you so when Iago says I am not what I am it gives him this sort of satanic overtone and this runs throughout the play um, the application of the word devil to Iago and also ironically to Othello um, one because he's got a dark exterior that people don't trust and one because he really is devilish inside um, you'll notice that Iago goes ahead and sets up a scene he's a stage manager he's very effective he sets up Roderigo where he can be seen and then he does all the screaming and rouses up Brabantio who is Desdemona's father and he uses the most foul possible language that he can um, all these filthy overtones are your doors locked why wherefore ask you this Zoon, sir, you are robbed for shame. Put on your ground, your gown. Your heart is burst. You have lost half your soul. Even now, now, very now, an old black ram is tupping your white you. Arise, arise, awake the snorting citizens with the bell, or else the devil will make a grandsire of you. Arise, I say. Well, Brabantio recognizes Roderigo and says, I thought I told you to leave my daughter alone. And Roderigo, who is a little bit gutless, starts to say, well, I'm really sorry, but, you know, I really thought you ought to be told that your daughter has eloped with Othello. And meanwhile, Iago puts in all of the things that's liable to make um, Brabantio as angry as possible. You'll have your nephews nay to you. You'll have coursers for cousins and genets for Germans. What profane wretch art thou? I am one, sir, that comes to tell you that your daughter and the moor are now making the beast with two backs. Well, of course, you know, you go to an affectionate father and you tell him that his daughter is sleeping with somebody in this very graphic language is obviously going to upset him. And Brabantio says that he has had a nightmare like this and actually he starts to believe it he starts to get together a group of people to arrest Othello and immediately the first thing he thinks of is he must have used witchcraft is there not charms by which the property of youth and maidhood may be abused have you not read Roderigo of some such thing the assumption is he must have used witchcraft because nobody could possibly have convinced, no one that looks like Othello could possibly have convinced a beautiful young lady like Desdemona to love him just based upon what he is. Um, Iago, for all that he has been screaming this stuff, this ugly stuff where he can't be seen, in the next scene we see him with Othello and he's acting the honest servant just like he said he would. Um, Roderigo, of course, must be very dumb because Iago has just told him, I'm, you know, I just do what I want for my own good. I, I never can be really trusted. And Roderigo proceeds to trust him. Othello, at least, does not know that part. Iago says, be con uh, to, you know, are you sure that you've actually married Desdemona as much as, you know, as legally as possible because they're going to try to have the marriage annulled if you're not. And the fellow is confident that his services as a general will outweigh anything that happens. He knows that he's valuable. He knows that he's, his military prowess had, has made him just absolutely vital to the Venetians. That's what he's counting on. But that isn't necessarily, of course, going to be true. Um, Brabantio comes in and accuses Othello to his face of witchcraft. 
O oh, thou fell thief, where hast thou stowed my daughter? Damned as thou art, thou hast enchanted her. But I'll refer me to all things of sense, if she in chains of magic were not bound. Whether a maid so tender, fair, and happy, so opposite to marriage that she shunned the wealthy curled darlings of our nation, would have to incur a general mock run from her guardage to the sooty bosom of such as thou. To fear, not to delight, judge me the world, if it is not gross in sense that thou hast practiced on her with foul charms. So he's absolutely convinced it has to be witchcraft. Um, Othello says that he will answer to any charges that Brabantio makes. And he's sent for to the Senate, a midnight meeting of the Senate, where the Duke is trying to put together um, a fleet. There's um, Venice has traditionally been enemies with Turkey, and they have argued over Cyprus and Rhodes, and there's this great, big, huge fight over that. Um, and because there's been an attack, and they've been informed about this in the middle of the night, they're already having a council of war at the Senate. Brabantio is taking Othello there because he wants to prosecute um, the, the charge about his daughter. And so everybody winds up in um, the Senate in scene three. We have all these people coming in talking about how panicky they are and how many people that the Turks have levied against the Venetians, and they're really worried. Um, they know that the only person who can really do this, the only person who can really effectively fight, has got to be Othello. He's the only person with the qualifications to handle this. Now, they do talk about him as the more, the more, the more, the more, the more. But when he walks in, the Duke calls him Valiant Othello. We must straight employ you against the general enemy Ottoman. Um, Ottoman meaning Turk. Well, he's Othello to his face. Behind his back, he's the Moor. Um, you see a similar thing in Merchant of Venice, where for every time that Shylock is called Shylock, he's called the Jew over and over. And when you do that and you refuse somebody's name, you sort of dehumanize that person. Um, Brabantio talks about how some person has stolen his daughter by using witchcraft, and the Duke says, well, I'm terribly upset about that. That's awful. And you shall yourself read in the bitter letter of the, the law after your own sense. Yea, though our proper son stood in our actions. So you can be judge, jury, and executioner. And Brabantio says, it's that guy, a fellow. And all they can say is, we are very sorry for it, because Othello is right. He is too valuable. But they still have to answer this charge. Now, Othello starts a defense. And his defense, in the course of it, he says, rude am I in my speech. But Othello is far from rude in his speech. Othello, in fact, speaks the most elegant language in the play. And I suspect that one of the reasons that Shakespeare does this is because if you know somebody who has learned, say, English as a second language and has learned it extremely well, sometimes they actually speak with um, more precision and uh, with more elegance than a person who is a native speaker who can be sort of sloppy. That's most particularly true of English um, in this country, but it's true of almost anyone. So he has this long speech in which he uses as many different rhetorical figures as he can. Most potent, grave, and reverend seniors, my very noble and approved good masters, that I have taken away this old man's daughter, it is most true. True, I have married her. The very head and front of my offending hath this extent no more. Rude am I in my speech, and little blessed with the soft phrase of peace. For since these arms of mine had seven years pith, till now some nine moons wasted, they have used their dearest action in the tented field. 
and little of this great world can I speak more than pertains to feats of broils and battle, and therefore little shall I grace my cause in speaking for myself. So he says, I've been at war since I was seven years old until nine months ago with no stop. And I've never had um, the elegant training in speech. So instead, he's going to deliver what he calls a round, unvarnished tale. Um, just the straight truth. Um, and Brabantio points out that Desdemona has always been a very quiet girl. She's never been particularly rebellious or particularly um, flirtatious or anything like that. And he insists that it's against all rules of nature. You have to remember that in this country, um, this country, there have, were laws on the books, um, miscegenation laws that prevented um, people who are classified as white marrying from pe people who are classified as black and on the grounds that it was against nature. And Brabantio uses this argument to say this is against nature. Meanwhile, the senators want to know, did you in fact use witchcraft? You have to remember this is a culture that does believe in witchcraft. I'm talking about the Elizabethan culture now. So this is a serious charge, and of course the punishment is hideous death. And Othello says, let her speak for herself. Let her say what she will. And in the meantime, I will tell you how it was that I actually wooed her. And this is what Othello says. Her father loved me, oft invited me, still questioned me the story of my life from year to year, the battles, sieges, fortunes that I have passed. I ran it through, even from my boyish days to the very moment that he bade tell it. So Brabantio invited Othello to dinner, repeatedly brought him in as a friend. And it's little wonder that Desdemona is hearing this marvelously interesting stuff from somebody whom her father seems to treat with such honor does not think of this as being a person she should not respect, um, and that causes a great deal of trouble. Brabantio is happy to invite Othello to dinner, but he's not happy to have his daughter marry him. Wherein I spoke of most disastrous chances, of moving accidents by flood and field, of hairbreadth scapes and the imminent deadly breach, of being taken by the insolent foe and sold to slavery, of my redemption thence, importance in my travels history, whereof of antres vast and deserts idle, rough quarries, rocks and hills whose heads touch heaven, it was my hint to speak, such was my process. And of the cannibals that each other eat, the anthropophagi, and men whose heads do grow beneath their shoulders. These things to hear would Desdemona seriously incline. But still the house affairs would draw her thence, whichever she could with hate's dispatch. She'd come again and with a greedy ear devour up my discourse. Which I, observing, took once a pliant hour, and found good means to draw from her a prayer of earnest heart that I would all my pilgrimage dilate, whereof by parcels she had something heard, but not intentively. I did consent, and often did beguile her of her tears when I did speak of some distressful stroke that my youth suffered. My story being done, she gave me for my pains a world of sighs. She swore in faith was strange, twas passing strange. She wished she had not heard it, yet she wished that heaven had made her such a man. She thanked me, and bade me, if I had a friend that loved her, I should but teach him how to tell my story, and that would woo her. Upon this hint, I spake. Now, you'll notice several things going on here. Brabantio's painted this picture of this helpless little girl, but actually she runs his house, and that's why she hasn't heard all of Othello's um, speech. She hasn't heard everything. She's the one who goes to him and asks to hear the whole speech. When she has heard it, she says she wishes heaven had made her such a man, and 
if somebody were to tell me that story, I would just give in right away. I mean, she virtually tells him, she doesn't actually propose to him, but she pretty much says, if you propose to me, I would say yes. And upon this hint, broad hint, he spake. So like many women in Shakespeare, the assumption is that a good woman waits for the man to pursue her. Women are not supposed to be the aggressors in love. And yet, we have seen many occasions, Olivia for certainly, and um, we've seen um, now in Desdemona and to a certain extent Miranda, that it is very common. And as these women act against what is the cultural stereotype, they always make reference to the fact that it's unusual. And I often think that what's going on there is that Shakespeare's calling into question whether this cultural stereotype really fits or not. Brabantio says, if she says that she was half the wooer, then I wash my hands of this. And Desdemona comes in. Brabantio says, do you perceive in all this noble company where most you owe obedience? Tricky question. My noble father, I do perceive here a divided duty. To you I am bound for life and education. My life and education both do learn me how to respect you. You are the lord of duty. I am hitherto your daughter. But here's my husband, and so much duty as my mother showed to you, preferring her, you before her father. So much I challenge that I may profess due to the more, my lord. So that's her argument, that it is only proper and it is in the marriage ceremony that the parents have to assume a, a, subsur a sort of less important role and that the spouse is supposed to then be the person to whom the married person owes primary allegiance. And Brabantio is very disappointed, but he can't really argue with this. All right, so terrific. Othello and Desdemona get to stay married. Nobody's going to argue this. On the other hand, Othello is not going to get to celebrate his wedding night with her because he's instantly going to be sent off to deal with this war. And that raises the question of what is going to happen with Desdemona. Othello doesn't insist that he take her along. He says, well, maybe she should stay with her father. Brabantio does not want to have her back in his house. And Desdemona does not want to go back to his house because she knows it will make him angry to see her. And finally, it's Desdemona who insists, I want to go with Othello. Othello doesn't ask it for himself. She asks it, and she asks it in a very straightforward way um, about why she wants to be with him. That I did love the more to live with him, my downright violence and storm of fortunes may trumpet to the world. My heart subdued even to the very quality of my lord. I saw a fellow's visage in his mind, and to his honors and his valiant parts did I my souls and fortunes consecrate. So that, dear lords, if I be left behind a moth of peace, and he go to the war, the rights for why I love him are bereft me, and I a heavy interim shall support by his dear absence. Let me go with him. Now, she's very bold. First of all, she says, well, I married him in order to live with him. My heart subdued even to the very quality of my Lord. He is a soldier, and I am now a soldier's wife, and I belong with my husband. And if I stay at home, and he goes to war, bluntly, I can't sleep with him. And that's what married people do. She doesn't have any shame in stating this because there's no shame involved in that, really, if you think about it. Um, and Othello insists, oh, okay, if she can come, I promise I won't neglect my work. I promise nothing bad will happen if you do that. And they get separated. And Iago, ironically, is the person who is set to take care of Desdemona. Um, Iago and his poor wife, Amelia, um, have to keep an eye on her as they go to Cyprus while Othello goes to actually fight the battle. 
Rodrigo's very disappointed to hear how this all turned out, and he says he's going to drown himself, and Iago says that's a stupid thing to do. Um, you never solve anything by killing yourself. And what he tells Iago is nothing can be solved, um, that you know, nothing is unsolvable without a good big chunk of money, right? He says, you know, don't worry about the, you know, the upsetment. That's stupid. You know, you don't have to have an emotion if you don't want to. Come, be a man. Drown thyself? Drown cats and blind puppies. I have professed me thy friend, and I confess me knit to the disease I deserving with cables of perdurable toughness. I could never better stead thee than now. Put money in thy purse. Follow thou the wars. Defeat thy favor, or usurped beard. I say, put money in thy purse. It cannot be long that Desdemona should continue her love to the more, put money in thy purse, nor he to her. It was a violent commencement in her, and thou shalt see an answerable sequestration. Put but money in thy purse. These moors are changeable in their wills. Fill thy purse with money. The food that to him now is as luscious as locusts shall be as sturdy as a serb as in the colloquintida. She must change for youth when she is sated with his body. She will find the air of her choice. She must change. She must, therefore, put money in thy purse. And he refers to this marriage as being between a super subtle Venetian and an erring barbarian. Well, you notice the long list of reasons that he says that this marriage isn't going to last? Well, it started quickly, it'll end quickly. Well, you know, he'll get tired of her. Well, you know, she'll get tired of him. And this is all pushed in with, go get some money. Go get as much money as possible. Get money. Get some money. Get lots of money. And later on, he'll tell um, Othello, who steals my purse, steals trash. But obviously that's not really true. Othello, I mean, Iago is very happy to have whatever is in his purse, and ideally whatever is in everybody else's too. And he thinks, well, when Rodrigo goes off, he tells us that he thinks he's an idiot, which we kind of figured out. And then we also start to hear one of the reasons why he hates Othello. And one of the things that's extraordinary about this is that Iago gives a lot of different reasons for why he hates Othello. It's almost too many reasons. It's almost unreasonable. First reason why he hates Othello, Othello gave the job that he had come to think of as his job to somebody else, Michael Cassio. Now he says that he's got another reason. I hate the Moor, and tis thought abroad that twixt my sheets he has done my office. I know not if it be true, but I, for mere suspicion in that kind, will do it as if for surety. He holds me well, the better shall my purpose work on him. So he says now that he suspects of Othello of sleeping with his wife. He has no idea if it's true, but he's going to get revenge. He's going to act as though it is true and get revenge accordingly. So reason one, he gave away my job. Reason two, I think he slept with my wife. I'm not sure, but I might as well go after him before that. And we also get to see the wheels turning as Iago improvises what he's going to do. Cassio's a proper man. Let me see now, to get his place and to plume up my will in double knavery, how, how, let's see. After some time to abuse Othello's ear that he is too familiar with his wife. He hath a person and a smooth disposed to be suspected, framed to make women false. The more is of a free and open nature that thinks men honest that but seem to be so, and will as tenderly be led by the nose as asses are. I have it. It is engendered. Hell and night must bring this monstrous birth to the world's light. So he says, he knows that it's just a credible story. And he's thinking, how, 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 what can I do? Oh, great. I'll tell Othello that Cassio's sleeping with his wife. Uh, that'll get Cassio fired, it'll get him into big trouble, and it'll ruin Othello's day, if not, you know, his whole the rest of his life. So that seems like a reasonable thing to do. Cassio's a very handsome person, and therefore it'll seem credible. And Othello trusts him, and he can make use of that. Now, Act 2 begins with a tempest. And then the tempest subsides, and the first people that we see coming in 
are um, after the tempest subsides are um, uh, Desdemona and, uh, and um, Emilia and Iago. Cassio is already there, and he describes Desdemona. He describes her as the divine Desdemona. He suggests that somehow by her very nature she calms the seas. It's almost like she's a goddess. In fact, he describes her using language that would usually be applied to the Virgin Mary. He also describes her as our great captain's captain. So Othello is the captain, but she's captain over the captain, and everybody knows it, that she's got terrific power over him. When he speaks to her, he uses, again, the language of Marian praise. Oh, behold, the riches of the ship is come on shore. You men of Cyprus, let her have your knees. Hail to thee, lady. And the grace of heaven before, behind thee, on every hand, and wheel thee round. It's very much like, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And I think that's intentional. Um, it's almost a kind of idolatry to refer to uh, Desdemona that way. Um, Iago, on the other hand, says all kinds of nasty things about his wife in front of her face and everybody else. And he also says nasty things about women in general. And I won't go into too much detail here, but Desdemona decides to match wits with him. She's worried about her husband. It gets this off of her mind. And she ha he has nothing good to say about women. And even if she, when she says, well, can you imagine a woman who had all these virtues and yet was fair? And he describes a woman, um, she that was ever fair and never proud, had tongue at will and yet was never loud, um, really seems to almost be a description of Desdemona herself. And what is the most virtuous, beautiful woman good for? Uh, she's good for having babies and keeping the house running. In other words, even that kind of woman you're supposed to keep barefoot and pregnant. Um, not nice at all. Because he's so blunt and because he's so ugly, he manages to get away with the idea that therefore he must be honest. And we saw Richard III do this too. It was the same exact strategy. The assumption that he's honest and bluff and that he's rough in his speech but not what is the truth, that he is a creep. Um, when Othello comes in and greets Desdemona, he says something kind of ominous, that he feels that this is the happiest moment in his life, and it's all downhill from here. If it were now to die, t'were now to be most happy, for I fear my soul hath not her content so absolute that not another comfort like to this succeeds an unknown fate. This is like somebody saying, oh, I hope your wedding day is the most happy day of your life. I mean, it suggests, oh my gosh, the marriage isn't going to be so good. Desdemona says, well, no, I mean, let's hope it's all up from here. The heavens forbid but that our loves and comforts should increase even as our days do grow. So they've got different feelings, Othello already has this kind of pessimistic attitude, and that will make it a little easier for Iago to do what he's going to do. Um, when Iago explains or chooses the idea that, to use the idea that um, Cassio um, is in love with Desdemona, he says, you know, maybe he does. It's credible. It's, I believe it. And as far as Desdemona loving him, it's credible. It's probably not true, but it's credible. A person could believe it. And this is, again, when we get to hear his thinking. That Cassio loves her, I do well believe it. That she loves him, tis apt and of great credit. The more, howbeit I endure him not, is of a constant, loving, and noble nature. And I dare think he'll prove to Desdemona a most dear husband. Now... I do love her, too. Well, that's surprising. Why does he love her? The best reason he can come up with is lust. But that becomes not a, yet a third motive. You know, he, got, he gave away my job. Um, he slept with my wife. Um, I'm in love with his wife. We've got all these different reasons. And he describes this jealousy as something that gnaws him from the inside, that makes him sick inside. He knows the power of jealousy, 
and therefore he knows how strong it will be if he can actually fix it on Othello. And that his, is his plan, in fact. Um, his plan, the first way he's going to do this is that as Othello and Desdemona go off to celebrate their wedding night, which keeps being interrupted, there's even a suggestion, perhaps, that they never really do get to have a wedding night in this play, in which case it becomes even sadder. And Cassio insists that he doesn't want to drink. Everybody's drinking. Um, Iago says, oh, come on, come on, just have one more. Cassio says, well, I really, I'm not, I get drunk fast. I really, I can't, I'm supposed to be on duty here. They also start to talk about Desdemona. And Iago uses sort, of, uses sort of locker room language to describe her. And Cassio doesn't want to talk about her like that. Our general cast us thus early for the love of his Desdemona, who let us not therefore blame. He hath not yet made the night wanton with her, and she is sport for Jove. She is a most exquisite lady, and I'll warrant her full of game. Indeed, she's a most fresh and delicate creature. What an eye she has! Methinks it sounds a parley to provocation. An inviting eye, and yet methinks right modest. And when she speaks, is it not an alarum to love? She is indeed perfection. Well, happiness to their sheets. Well, so Cassio keeps putting off Iago's talk about Desdemona. Um, one of the things, too, is that we find out that Cassio has a girlfriend whom he basically seems to keep around to sleep with, and that he may be one of these people who can only um, think of a woman as either on a pedestal or in the gutter, and Desdemona is on the pedestal. Um, as he proceeds to get Cassio drunk, he grabs Montano, who's the local, and says, oh, yeah, he's like this all the time. In fact, he can't go to sleep without drinking. Um, Cassio's trying very hard to pretend that he's not drunk, and, of course, um, this is a sure sign that he is. Let's have no more of this. Yeah, let's do our affairs. God forgive us our sins. Gentlemen, let's look to our business. Do not think, gentlemen, that I am drunk. This is my ancient. This is my right hand. This is my left hand. I am not drunk now. I can stand well enough. And I speak well enough. Excellent well. Why then? You must not think then that I am drunk. So he's loaded, of course. And then it doesn't take very long for him to get to the belligerent phase. That is exactly what Iago's been counting on. He's expecting that there's going to be a fight. He makes sure that Montano gets hurt because Montano tries to break it up. And that makes Othello have to come out and split it up. It disturbs his wedding night. He's very angry. Why now? What ho? From hence, whence arises this? Are we turned Turks, and to ourselves do that which heaven hath forbid the Ottomites? So the idea the Turks are the uncontrolled people. For Christian shame, put up this barbarous brawl. He that stirs next to car for his own rage, souls heard his soul light. He dies upon his motion. Everybody shuts up. They put down their swords. This is authority speaking. And then he asks Iago what happened here. And Iago tries to explain it. He says, well, I don't know. Everybody seemed to be friends. And then this all happened. And, and I don't want to say anything bad about Cassio. Well, by saying I didn't want to say anything bad about Cassio, he makes it look as though he's Cassio's friend. But he makes it look worse for Cassio. And Othello says, I know that you make this light. I know that you mince this matter, making it light to Cassio. Cassio, I love thee, but never more be officer of mine. And he has to do that because Cassio has ruptured military discipline, and um, losing control like this is going to lose control of Cyprus. They can't behave that way. And then he gets even angrier because Desdemona wakes up to see what's going on. Cassio is terribly upset that he has lost his reputation, and he carries on about it at great length. 
reputation, reputation, reputation. Oh, I have lost my reputation. I have lost the immortal part of myself, and what remains is bestial. My reputation, Iago, my reputation. As I am an honest man, I thought you had received some bodily wound. There is more sense in that than in reputation. Reputation is an idle and most false imposition, oft got without merit and lost without deserving. You have lost no reputation at all. His point is, reputation? What's that? It's stupid. But later he's going to use this when he's talking to Othello, that reputation, my honest lord, is the immediate jewel of their soul. So Iago's always hunting around for things he can use later on. It's a sign that he's a really, really good um, actor. And Cassio can't even remember how this happened, and he gives... Iago gives Cassio good advice. He says, go and talk to Desdemona. You know that he'll do anything Desdemona asks. He loves her. And she's a very affectionate and generous person. And I'm sure she'll take up your cause. And if you do that, then, you know, I'm sure you'll get your job back. And Cassio says, that's a great idea. I know that that'll work. And Iago says, good night. Yeah, no thanks. No, don't mention it. Well, it is good advice, as he tells us. And what's he then that says, I play the villain? When this advice is free, I give, and honest, probable to thinking, and indeed the course to win the more again. This would work. For tis most easy the inclining Desdemona to subdue in any honest suit. She's framed as fruitful as the free elements. And then for her to win the more, were it to renounce his baptism, all seen signs and symbols of redeemed sin, his soul is so unfettered to her love that she may make, unmake, do what she list, even as her appetite may play the god with her weak function. How am I then a villain to counsel Cassio to this parallel course directly to his good? Divinity of hell. When devils will the blackest sins put on, they do suggest at first with heavenly shows, as I do now. So he says, I am like the devil. For whilst this honest fool plies Desdemona to repair his fortune, and she for him pleads strongly to the more, I'll pour this pestilence into his ear, that she repeals him for her body's lust, and by how much she strives to do him good, she will undo her credit with the more. So will I turn her virtue into pitch and out of her own goodness make the net that will enmesh them all. So this is the evil person using the virtue of other people to entrap them. So that is his plan, and that is how it's going to work. Um, he, he says straight out that he's a devil. He says straight out that he's going, his plan is to um, poison Othello, in a sense, to give him the poison of jealousy, which eats you out like a corrosive poison. And in this next scene, this next lecture, I'm going to concentrate on the process by which Othello goes through this, I mean, by which Iago goes through this, and how it is that he successfully pours poison in Othello's ear. So hang tight and we'll be with that in a few minutes.